and um, thanks to Vertical Events for the opportunity to present today. Yeah, so as uh, Jerry said, we, we think we have some of the highest grade um, cobalt and gold anywhere in the world and we're in British Columbia in Canada and um, we're going to step through some of the um, success we've had over the first field season since we acquired this asset uh, just over 12 months ago. So we have a portfolio of projects across uh, US, uh, Canada and, uh, and Australia and um, with a focus on the battery metals of uh, cobalt and nickel and as well as gold. So there's a broad sort of portfolio here. Um, today we'll focus mainly on the BC cobalt belt and the, and the BC um, project we have. Um, we have uh, further nickel assets in Quebec, in Cartier, uh, that's an early stage Voises Bay style target over in Quebec. Um, we have some gold in the Pilbara and we also will today talk about the Silver Swan South asset near Kalgoorlie where we're looking for gold and, and nickel sulphides. So this is a quick snapshot of those uh, assets. Um, the BC Cobalt Project is, is the uh, flagship asset. Um, we intersected 3% cobalt and 44 grams per tonne gold um, and, and, um, and this, this was very similar to the historic grades um, that they, when they first discovered the, the deposit. Um, very quickly we drilled that first target and, um, and now we're moving on to the, the, um, the further targets throughout the belt. We have a 48 kilometre package of what we believe is potential for world class cobalt deposits. Silver Swan South, we're um, just a long strike of the Canaanabel gold mine and uh, a great address, uh, only 40 kilometres out of Kalgoorlie. Um, we actually picked up the ground for the nickel sulphide potential um, because we're south of the Silver Swan mine, which was a 10% nickel mine in its day and, and one of Australia's better nickel mines um, and a long strike of, one of what, what is one of Australia's premier uh, underground gold mines at Canaanabel. And yeah, and Cartier and Middle Creek are lower priorities and, um, and we're looking for gold and, and nickel at those assets uh, in Canada and Western Australia. So this is a bit of a corporate snapshot, um, a little bit like most of my cobalt focused peers. Um, it turned a little bit uh, uh, as, as the cobalt spot price um, depleted, but um, we think we're in a better position than we've have ever been, both corporately and, um, and technically. Um, we have $1.2 million in the bank, but we're um, progressing with uh, some battery end users and, and we believe that um, we, we found um, some significant capital sources that we, we uh, may be able to joint venture into our, our large asset. Um, board and management have a strong position, 24%. We have a very um, supportive sh shareholder from Germany in Deutsche Balaton. Um, the, the vendors of the asset also hold a fair uh, chunk, about 14% of the, um, the register. So it makes for a very tight structure, only 108 million shares on issue, so fairly uh, young company, um, capital structure, uh, uh, very tight and, and can move on uh, not much volume. Um, board and management, um, Hamish and Steve, I think everyone probably has heard of these two um, mining entrepreneurs have been together for 20 years. Um, Hamish, whose uh, claim to fame was the Adamus Resources uh, Company, which was uh, a $3 million float and a multi-million ounce discovery in West Africa. Um, eventually, that mine was taken over by Endeavour. Um, Steve did a similar thing with Griffin. Um, multi-million ounce discovery in Burkina Faso, and then uh, that was taken over by Taranga. Um, and most importantly, Steve's also re-rated uh, Bellevue Gold, uh, probably the best performing resource stock on the market in the last 12 months. So um, very happy to be sitting in the booth uh, in front of Bellevue and uh, picking up some of the crumbs. Um, Dr. Stuart Owen down the bottom, uh, one of the better geologists I've ever worked with, uh, and, and similar with Andrew Radonjic. So a team of uh, probably too many geologists, but that's all right. I, um, I'm a mining engineer, so I can, uh, I can give them uh, plenty of slick, um, 
but uh, yeah, so there's a, there's a lot of uh, technical capabilities there, but also, more importantly, the ability to take things uh, corporately as well. All right, we're six hours out of Vancouver. This is some of the highest grade cobalt you find anywhere in the world. That rock is at the booth. That's 6% cobalt, 46 grams per tonne gold. It's a historic gold mining district and they've mined 4.4 million ounces at 18 grams per tonne gold. Um, so it's a high grade gold district, never been explored for cobalt. This is some of the highest grade cobalt you're going to find anywhere in the world. And it's actually the most prolific gold belt in British Columbia and one of the they're some of the highest grade gold you'll find anywhere in the world. We have, um, we've tested the little gem adits. They did some mining back in the 1930s and 50s. Unfortunately, that first target didn't uh, prove up to have the scale that we required for a modern day mine. Um, but we're very quickly moving on to the, the next few targets, which uh, looks pretty exciting. Okay, so these are some of the numbers. Uh, to put that in perspective, the average um, cobalt sort of deposit in the world today is around about 0.1% cobalt. So we're looking at 10 times the average on, and sometimes multiples on that. So, and also the gold um, sort of ounce, but they, they actually uh, count their gold in ounces per tonne over there. So, and you can see why, because uh, some of these numbers are multiple ounce per tonne. Most importantly also, we're getting good numbers in the disseminated zones. So the, the cobalt percentage of the uh, mineralisation is very high, so you don't need much sulphide to, to get a good number. So, um, and that's why the disseminated numbers are also very high. Okay, this was our first lot of drilling. It confirmed high grade. Um, it hit a big, broad alteration package. Um, unfortunately, the sulphides were limited, and then very quickly we needed to decide Okay, um, we'll move on to the next, uh, the next target. So we drilled about 300 metres of strike. We've definitely tested that first target. This is 300 metres of a package of 48 kilometres of we, what we believe is cobalt bearing geology. So we stepped along strike and gave that a good crack and, uh, and it didn't deliver the size we're after. While we were drilling that, one of the geologists stumbled upon some uh, visible gold about 900 metres away. That also ran 2% cobalt, 1.6% uh, copper, uh, ounce per tonne gold again, bit of nickel. We've made two new discoveries within the region. We've also, this is the first discovery of cobalt outside of the Little Gem area since 1930, and the only reason is we're the first people to ever look for cobalt in this region. At the same time we made that discovery at Erebor, we did this IP survey and you can see the, the outline of the IP survey. So we, sit, we did one line across the little gem structure, another line across this contact between the uh, granite diorite and the serpentinized ultramafic, which is this dual target. And what we're doing is we're looking for sulphides. So we knew that once we're in the sulphides, the, the grey's going to come. The gold is all, always associated with the sulphides and the cobalt, copper and nickel. And this is what we got. Um, the, the interesting part with this is we always knew that that contact between the granite diorite and ultramafic was where we needed to be. We knew there was potential for an intrusion in the system and it uh, looks like we found it. So that, that uh, IP anomaly across the dual, dual area, that's over 1.5 kilometres long. So that's a, a sulphide bearing system um, and, and we've got very good uh, indications that we're, we've got metal associated with it. The, uh, little, down near Little Gem and Erebor, there's also a nice little target down there. Um, to, when I say little, there's probably room to fit 10 million tonnes in that, that small, small zone uh, down to the bottom here. So that's 300 metres from Little Gem, 300 metres from Erebor. There's a good chance that this high grade we're seeing at Little Gem and Erebor may be associated with that IP. Uh, anomaly. Okay, this is the long section across that little gem. So we drilled around the adits. The IP uh, lit up and it, and it coincided with the mineralisation we hit in the drilling. But clearly um, we need to be heading along strike and, um, and testing these, these anomalies. The, these are anomalies that can't be seen. There's no outcrop. Um, there's a reason why they haven't sort of been tested before. This is technology they obviously didn't have in the 1930s. 
So that's the little gem trend, and this is the jewel trend. Um, that's a very large sulphide-bearing body, um, and very good uh, copper and gold. The jewel mine was a very high-grade uh, gold mine, about 73 grams per tonne gold. They only mined 51 tonnes, so a couple of wheelbarrows full. And obviously they didn't know that they were sitting on a big sulphide system underneath it. There's also cobalt associated with that jewel area as well. So at the same time we're doing the IP, we did the soils. So this is your copper in soil anomaly right above a very large sulphide body. Um, we also did a, mo a full suite of elements, so we're getting good copper, cobalt. So the cobalt also coincides with the large IP anomaly at Jewel. And most importantly, uh, we also have gold. So we've got a copper, gold, cobalt system, and we've got some very high-grade cobalt and gold around Little Gem and Erebor. We've got high-grade copper, gold, and anomalous cobalt at Jewel. Um, now we just need some uh, drill holes. That area we're, we're just looking at is a very small area up here. So we have Jewel, Erebor, all those um, uh, targets up here. We've got 48 kilometres of that exact same geology. So the Braylon mine, which is where they mined 4.4 million ounces, is very well centrally located throughout our in the middle of our tenement package. And the reason we went and pegged 48 kilometres of, of this particular geology is because we believe we have the same geology as the Buazia mine in Morocco. So Buazia uh, still mines cobalt today, plus 1% cobalt. It's the only primary cobalt mine in the world today. They've been mining cobalt for 75 years and they've mined over 100,000 tonnes of cobalt. They, that's about 2 to 3% of the world's supply. And, um, and most importantly, it's the only primary cobalt mine in the world. So 97% of the world's supply of cobalt is a byproduct of nickel or copper. And this is the only primary cobalt mine. These mines sit on a contact between a serpentinite, ultramophic, and a quartz diorite, which is this. So this is in Morocco, underground, serpentinite, diorite, mineralisation. They have 50 deposits through this belt. That's the exact same contact we have through 48 kilometres of. So, Bouazia, Morocco, been mining cobalt for 75 years. We've got the most prolific gold belt in British Columbia. We've got the same geology as Morocco, never been explored for cobalt. This is going to take a while to really unlock what we've got here, and this is why we're looking for big funding partners in the battery and users in, uh, in Asia. All right, back to Australia. This is where I started, um, back in uh, this WA School of Mines. Uh, as a mining engineer running an exploration company, I don't know what I'm doing there, but um, this, it's great to be back, actually very nearby. The first mine I, mine I worked at was the Silver Swan mine, so we're at Silver Swan South, so 10 kilometres south of Silver Swan. The second mine I worked at was Canana Bell, and we're eight kilometres along strike of that. The good thing with that is we've got potential for not just nickel sulphides, but also gold. We picked it up for the nickel sulphides, and very quickly we thought, 10, we've hit 10 metres at three, in bottom of hole air core, three at three. The Canana Bell ore body was, was discovered with, uh, with fairly, uh, I suppose, not exciting uh, air core, of, well, RAB form, four at three, two at 11. So it, it, it's all under cover, so we're under a lake. Um, it's 60 to 100 metres worth of cover. Um, we're a long strike on the Fitzroy Shear Zone, about eight kilometres from what I believe is one of the, the best underground gold mines in Australia. So you can see the Canana Bell um, to scale over here, and this air core um, anomalism, very similar size, no, no holes into fresh rock. So we're going to get some diamond rigs out there next month and, uh, and test some of these targets. But also we've got nickel, uh, copper, platinum, palladium, arsenic, all the indicators of a nickel sulphide system and it was actually the nickel sulphides that got us excited about this ground and we'll also test for nickel sulphides while we're out there and uh, with a focus on the, on the battery end users that we're, we're talking to. 
Okay, we're exploring one of the highest grade cobalt projects in the world. We're in a first world, um, uh, one of the better, best mining jurisdictions in the world, some of the best geology you'll find. We're hitting 3% cobalt. Um, now we need to hit, hit some tonnes. And um, first company to explore for cobalt in this region and the first company in 60 years to do systematic um, uh, modern day exploration. Same geology as the Bouazir mine in Morocco, which is the best cobalt mine in the world, and, uh, and some great gold and nickel sulphide uh, exposure in Western Australia. So we'll test the gold while uh, the snow is still uh, on the ground. The snow will clear in British Columbia around April, May, and we'll be hitting those big IP anomalies and, and trying to hit some, uh, some high-grade cobalt. Most importantly, we've got a track record and, and a history of um, technical and corporate success and creating uh, wealth for shareholders. Thank you for your time.